So welcome everyone to this webinar. It's really a pleasure to have so many of you joining from throughout the world. Uh, I'm Harriet Lamb, I'm the CEO of Ashton and your chair for the next one hour on this subject that is very dear to my heart about how we can ensure that refugees and people displaced within their own countries have access to sustainable energy. So here's the rules of the game. We're recording this session uh, and we'll put it on our web afterwards and we'll be sharing it on social media. I'm delighted to say that we also have some journalists here and that we're live streaming. So this is definitely on the record. And we would love it if you would tweet and talk about this session now or afterwards, as obviously one of our aims is to put the spotlight on this vitally important and sometimes and often overlooked topic. So please feel free to tweet away. And please also join in via the chat function. Share your thoughts, introduce yourselves to the room, put your comments and questions to the panel. We want to hear from you as much as possible in the next hour. So don't feel shy, don't feel you have to wait till the end, just pop down your comments as we go. So here's the plan for the next hour. After some introductory remarks from myself, I'm delighted to introduce Arvind Kumar. Arvind is the project manager of the UNDP part of the Enhanced Rural Resilience Project in Yemen. And he's done some most outstanding work that he will be sharing, followed by Alessandro Leone from the EU, one of the main funders. And then we will move to our all-star panel, who I will introduce by asking them some questions and giving them their chance to share their thoughts and also to start responding, I hope, to questions from yourselves. As you might know, Ashton was founded about 20 years ago to uncover and put the spotlight on innovation in energy access. And over that time, we have seen incredible progress, of course, and yet still too many are living without access to energy, including and in particular the growing number of people who are forced to become refugees or internally displaced in their own countries. Already 80 million people who find themselves in that situation. And I think we can only expect that number to grow in particular as climate change hits more and more countries. Many of course live in towns and cities and many also live in camps. And in those camps it's estimated that about 80% of people have only very minimal access to energy for cooking and heating. And 90% have no access to electricity. In the Dab camp in Kenya, for example, it's also thought that people spend about a quarter of their income on fuel. And so that's the scale of the challenge we face. And yet there are so many fantastic initiatives bubbling up there that could provide the solutions as we go forward. And that's why last year at Ashton, we ran our first ever award for energy access in humanitarian settings. And thanks to funding from J.A. Clark, from the Limbury Trust, from Telus Mater. And we were just overwhelmed by the response. Applications flooded in from all over the world. And I can tell you, it was probably the toughest judging panel. Sarah was on the panel uh, and can, can probably uh, testify to that, the difficulty we had choosing between all the incredible initiatives. But against this tough competition, we were absolutely delighted to honour UNDP Yemen as a more than worthy, outstanding winner, as you will hear in a moment. And given the response we had to the award last year, and given the pandemic and the economic crisis putting a sharper than ever focus on the importance of clean energy for health and resilience, and given the bubbling up of innovation within humanitarian energy, we absolutely felt we wanted to run the award again this year and to really look to uncover those inclusive participatory approaches that people are trialling in among refugee communities. And so far we've had funding from the Annam Babette Sainsbury's Charitable Trust and from the Limbury Trust again and from an amazing group of incredibly generous individuals. And we're still looking to fill that final gap so that the award is fully funded. 
and uh, we run the call for entries. And once again, we've had the most amazing set of applications coming in from Syria through to Uganda, which is absolutely clearly a hub of energy innovation. Some of them with new technological solutions, but mainly about new business models, about refugees themselves leading initiatives to make access to energy really practical and accessible to people's needs. So watch this space when we announce this year's shortlist for the award for energy access in humanitarian settings. And to give you a sense of the outstanding initiatives that people are forging in the most difficult of circumstances, let's take a look at the film that Ashton made to celebrate UNDP Yemen's amazing solar project. And then let's hear from Arvind more about that. Thank you so much, Harriet, and Emily, for uh, giving us this opportunity today to present Yemen uh, and the um, Ashton Award uh, 2020, uh, the initiative that we have taken. Uh, we are still continuing and uh, with the gender support from European Union. Um, it's lovely to have you, Alvin. Shall we have a quick look at the film first and then we'll move to your slides? اسمي إيمان غالب هادي الحملي مديرة محطة مشروع صديقات البيئة للطاقة الشمسية خوف خجل كذلك تردد لكن بما بعد هذا المشروع بعد هذا المشروع اعتماد على النفس الثقة لأن كفتيات خريجات ليس لدينا فرصة أمل ونعين الأسرة كذلك هذه الدورة التدريبية لمدة 20 يوم فيها الدورات التدريبية عملنا دراسات حول المنازل المحتاجة للكهرباء عملنا دراسة كذلك عن التكاليف المطلوبة للطاقة الشمسية أول مشروع في مديرية أبس صح لأننا واجهنا صعوبات في دراستها كأول كمبتدا لنا كمبدئيا لعشرين شخص بنوصل طبعا رسالتي أنا لكل فتيات أبس أو في محافظة حجية أو في كل محافظات اليمن أن يسعوا لتحقيق رغباتهم أن يسعوا لتحقيق أحلامهم وطموحات Thank you so much, uh, uh, Harriet, uh, introducing UNDP Yemen and European Union. Uh, and we are really privileged to share our experience uh, from the last year and where we stand now in terms of this solar energy uh, initiative. Uh, I, I, I have a presentation which I would like to share with the, uh, with the audience and, and, and all of you. You all can see my screen. We can, Alvin, it's perfect. So uh, this is a Yemen Solar Community Project uh, uh, and, and we were the recipient of Aston Humanitarian Energy Award in 2020. Uh, uh, this uh, program basically is supported by European Union and it's also a joint program uh, where uh, WFP, ILO, uh, FU, uh, FAO and UNDP is working together. Uh, and, and building the resilience in, in, the, in the protracted crisis in Yemen. Um, so if you look at the project itself, I mean the solar microgrid model, uh, initially understanding the challenges around the affordability to the energy, accessibility to the energy, and, and, and looking at the pre one of the most pressing problem in Yemen, which is income generation at the sustained sustain level because people do not have access to income. Uh, to afford food or, or any other basic necessities. So in that background, I think the business model, uh, we wanted to create uh, a business model where, where community can have the income as well as uh, the energy um, uh, in Yemen. Um, obviously, uh, uh, we also wanted to focus on community engagement 
uh, while introducing energy uh, because there is also a humanizing approach uh, towards the energy that how energy can enter into the humanitarian and protected crisis uh, and also we have a development crisis unfolding in Yemen. So um, the approach was uh, to bring uh, not just only a group of women but others to understand the importance of uh, clean and green energy at the same time how community can have a buy-in um, so that you know the engagement can be much more stronger the key messages around the energy can also uh, go very well uh, when it when it comes to implementation what we also looked at it in this uh, solar microgrid model is the is the um, services uh, most of the time, you know, the, the solar energy services are quite centralized and quite expensive. We, we did look at that while installing the solar microgrid, how uh, the operation and maintenance are going to be uh, handled. And for that reason, um, the concept like, you know, the community technicians who can handle um, the operation and maintenance aspect, because most of these women are graduates, they understand um, the, the uh, basics of, of operation and maintenance now after receiving the training from the project. You can see that you know, a group of women are, uh, are able to connect uh, solar panels, the wiring, um, they, can, they can manage the batteries. Uh, so all these have, uh, uh, all these are, uh, you know, women were trained through the series of training through, uh, through the project. Um, uh, to, to make sure that uh, the business model survives and, and, and they themselves are able to uh, handle um, if there is any break, breakdown in, in, in the, in the uh, microgrid station. But at the same time, I, I think uh, the, the struggle between a fossil fuel and this renewable energy is that how we make this competitive uh, if it is um, a business solution. Uh, and definitely in Yemen, um, the prototype solutions, the solar household solutions are quite expensive in a sense like they are not uh, catered to the demand and the affordability. They are more catered to the, you know, what is a more popular model. Uh, and therefore it is quite expensive for people who are, uh, who are unable to have their income on a daily basis. Uh, to access energy in that sense. And, and Yemen has a long, a large number of group of people who do not have access to energy. So what we try to build is that, you know, how a business solution can become very competitive so that it can also appeal private sector and others to jump in because uh, there are private sector um, working in this area uh, and, and contributing to the GDP, um, you know, positively uh, and how we can then expand and widen um, the solution to the community level, but also focusing on affordability. So you can see that, you know, the, the solar microgrid model is providing two cents uh, an hour um, electricity while, while uh, you know, fossil fuel is uh, able to provide 42 cents uh, for, for limited hours. So that's the comparison and business model that has actually uh, you know help uh, to uh, help in succeeding this this business model and, and and we started this model in 2018 and until now it is running uh, i mean this if you look at this visual it speaks a lot actually you know that it's not just about solar panels and the batteries and bringing them together i think it's all about uh, how a group of women have come out um, you know, and, and broken those uh, social barriers, uh, engaged in economic activities, but also become a change agent. Um, often than not, there are, there are um, employment availability is there in Yemen, but uh, sometimes, you know, the engagement of women is very, very difficult. So we looked at that perspective, the gender perspective, uh, the employment, and, and, and this, uh, a, a, the solar energy provides a very decent and dignified job. And that's why this has appealed the most in, in, in an area which is very close to the front line, uh, which is uh, which is very close society, but the women uh, were able to manage uh, to to break that barrier and provide the key and and, and has given a key message to the their community where they live. So the whole idea was that you know if you look at the Yemen as an energy infrastructure, um, of course there are a lot of initiative that UNDP is doing at, at um, you know bringing into the blueprint uh, for renewable energy investment. However, the infrastructure in energy sector is still uh, very weak and it will take some time to, to, uh, to catch up. Uh, but the decentralized solar solution um, is, is one way to look at it that how affordable energy uh, uh, can, can be accessed by anybody and everybody. Because one, it is uh, cheaper. Second, it is also very clean. And third is that you know, this also provides you the income. So these are very much linked. 
and this is where we have um, a, a invested our time, um, you know, with the support, and 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 we are continuing to work in phase two of of the programming. Um, this is where we we receive the humanitarian energy award. Uh, when it comes to the impact, you know, uh, from the ASDEN, I think we have moved, uh, you know, very well actually. Uh, there were a lot of recognition that has also come. You can see one of one of the beneficiaries were identified as. 100 uh, influential women, uh, 2020 by BBC. Um, then uh, uh, the, our ambassador has also written about the initiatives, uh, the digital planet, uh, you know, uh, captured by BBC. And, and SDG has identified one of the best practice uh, out of 16. Um, so so there, there were many positive outcomes that, that also has come and captured this initiative. And then UNDP is now taking um, you know, uh, forward, uh, we, are, we are trying to scale up the solar microgrid model. At the moment when we speak, uh, this group of women is actually providing um, the, uh, the loan and support to their communities and they are planning to scale up to 3,000 households. So such kind of a, you know, powerful model that has been developed, uh, which is uh, very successful in business term, but which is also very successful in giving social messaging. So this is where uh, the solar microgrid stands. Uh, in terms of challenging and COVID, I must say that, you know, uh, obviously there was an impact on MSMEs, uh, but uh, when we look at the, uh, the solar energy uh, MSMEs, I think uh, they are able to overcome the barrier because of the nature of the sector as well as uh, the, the structure. Uh, and this group of, uh, you know, women who are running the solar microgrid is, is still um, ma making profit uh, by selling the energy. Now they have reached to 42 households and there are many in queues to, to, to get the access. So uh, what we have understood is that, you know, uh, the solar microgrid model needs to also have to diversify to reach public se uh, services, which is also one of the key areas where Yemen is struggling due to the structural problem. So um, thank you very much uh, for listening and, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you so much, uh, Arvind. And I think um, Suleiman Abdullahi speaks for all of us in the chat when uh, writing outstanding project. It really is so inspiring to watch. And indeed, Iman, who got uh, named as among the BBC top 100 is the woman that, that you will have all just seen in the film. So it's amazing uh, to see the progress that they've made. Uh, and I wanted to also put a first question to you, Arvind, that actually Anthony Ogilvy Thompson asks in the chat, how much does each mini grid cost and what capacity does each of those mini grids have? Thanks, Anthony, for the question. Uh, if you look at the, this one, it's like 63 kilowatt. Uh, it's a small one. Um, the way we have used is that UNDP has a three by six approach where we provide the grant, a small grant to, to the beneficiaries. And, and total costing was around $9,000 um, uh, for, for this uh, you know, particular station. Thanks very much and keep the questions coming everyone. I'd now like to turn to Alessandro Leone, who's the local governance and stabilization oh. attache in the EU delegation to Yemen and has been uh, the key funder of the first stage of the project and is indeed continuing together with CEDA to the second stage, along with the implementing partner, Sustainable Development Foundation. So Alessandra, do put on your video so we can all see you. And you must be so proud um, about this incredible initiative that you've so generously funded. Indeed, I am, we all are. And thank you very much for having me here today. So um, the EU has provided since uh, 2015, more than 320 million euros in long-term assistance for development and cooperation in uh, Yemen. This makes us uh, one of the leading development donors in uh, the country. For what concerns our project called uh, ARI, I'm really, really proud, as we said, uh, to say that the EU has supported its activities with a total of 77 million euros for both phase one and two. As you probably know, um, the EU has an um, all-encompassing approach covering humanitarian aid, uh, support for resilience and development, particularly ARI, which covers livelihood, local governance, green economy. As we've seen, SME support allows for a complete reach out to communities, leaving no one behind. Um, we, we are, of course, very proud of that because ARI has become one of the best performing EU programs in, uh, in Yemen because phase one has had such a great impact that our Swedish friends decided to chip in with additional 10 million euros. And most importantly, 
because Ari has become greener and greener. In fact, it has supported thousands of Yemenis finding alternative energy solutions to their daily struggle. And the microgrid initiative, illustrated by Arvind, is just, a, uh, just an example of that. I am um, rather confident that uh, this can become a model for future actions in similar countries. So, not here to tell you how marvelous it is and uh, uh, how great an impact it, uh, it has had, but rather that this project is perfectly in line with the European Green Deal. Now, without going into technical details or the figures that you can find everywhere on the internet, I want to focus on something different. Um, I really, really think that the Green Deal is a radical project to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. It covers every aspect of society and the economy and includes goals for biodiversity and agriculture. So in practical terms, what does it mean? It means to carbonize the energy sector, renovate buildings to help people cut their energy bills, support industry to innovate and boost the green economy, and finally roll out cleaner, cheaper and healthier forms of private and public transport. I also believe that, um, how can I say, this is a huge success for those scientists for the lobbyists and for the campaigners who have waged a decade-long battle to make global warming a central concern. So the European deal is our strategy for sustainable growth. And, and now it's also our roadmap out of the crisis. One third of the investments from our recovery plan, the next generation EU, maybe you heard this before, will finance the goals set out in the Green Deal. Together with the EU budget, and that's the only number I want to give, we're investing 1.8 trillion euros. So this will bring, of course, massive investments to build forward better and more sustainable. So the last thing I want to say, and I want to be clear on this, the, the Green Deal is as important today as it has been before COVID-19. If, if anything, it has become even more important. Is increasing evidence that the loss of biodiversity is one of the root causes for this global pandemic. We see it everywhere, from the collapse of glacier in northern India, which killed dozens of people, to the many, many crops destroyed in many countries, including Yemen, with the severe droughts of last year. So climate change is the massive crisis beyond COVID-19. Therefore, after the pandemic, there can be no backsliding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandro, and thank you for that reminder about the scale of the issues that we face from Yemen through to in the EU itself. I'd now like to move on to our all-star panel uh, and to kick off by asking them some questions I've got myself, but also I, there are some fantastic questions coming in in the chat, which I see people are either answering directly and maybe we can also uh, here from Alke, okay, some of the question, answers to the questions for UNDP. But to kick us off, I want to go to Luke Severy from uh, SE for All. Um, Luke leads SE for All's programme on powering healthcare, so I can imagine you've been pretty busy in the past year. And your focus is on advancing the, had the deployment of reliable and renewable power solutions for unelectrified, but also under-electrified, health facilities and also in humanitarian settings and Luke I know just yesterday SE for All launched your Be Bold campaign on energy access uh, as a whole so what would be the Be Bold campaign ask on energy access um, in humanitarian settings? Thanks Harriet and just starting with a small question right um, <laughs> I, I think in, in general when we think about Sustainable Development Goal 7 on, on renewable energy, on energy efficiency, and then for, for me personally, most importantly, energy access, we're, we see positive signs. By and large, we're not on track. So there, there is quite a lot of, of progress that's being made. Um, there's, there's a lot of potential, but overall it's being hampered by, by technology, by the lack of data, by cost still. Uh, by population growth, by migration patterns. Um, the, the, the biggest gap today that I see, the, the, the boldness that we need is, is we, we, need to, we need to find a way to, to bridge the gap on, on risk. So mm -hmm. that comes either from, from, from donors, from multilaterals uh, providing de-risking mechanisms. It comes from private sector actors who are 
more willing and able to take on additional risk. It comes from, from refugees and displaced households being allowed to take on risk, for example, by picking out, taking up microloans um, to, to deploy um, energy solutions, for example, for productive uses. Um, it, it's not one of these areas that we need to have. We need all of these areas to happen more or less at the same time. Um, and, and that's especially when we look at energy access for displaced households, there's a parallel track in the humanitarian setting, which is just looking at, at the UN agencies, looking at the humanitarian agencies and the amount of diesel that they consume just to be able to operate, to be able to offer services to, to refugees and to displaced households. So the whole greening the blue, the whole greening the humanitarian sector is a, is a parallel track that we shouldn't forget about either. And, and I feel too often we treat them in silos um, you know, like energy access for, for refugees or energy access for the humanitarian agencies. Um, I, I think there's, we, we need to acknowledge that we, we need to address both and, and not think that addressing one of these pillars will automatically flow over into the other. So I'd say Thanks that that would be my, my bold statement. Wow, yes, <laughs> laying, out, <laughs> laying out the scale of the challenges there. And um, actually, because of something you said, I'm going to change the order of the panel. I have to bring in, uh, in Innocent Chilombo at this point. Uh, Innocent, if you could put on your camera and join the panel, I'd like to particularly thank Innocent um, because he very kindly agreed to join this panel at last minute notice because unfortunately Joel Hange, who was going to be on the panel and has also herself was an Ashton judge last year, unfortunately is ill. So our very best wishes go to Joel and so thrilled to have you uh, join us, Innocent. You're the founder of Kakuma Ventures, you're also, by the way, doing a master's in humanitarian action at the Geneva Center for Humanitarian Studies. But I guess you having set up a, a, an, a, an enterprise to bring energy to the camp, Kakuma, in Kenya, no one knows more about risk. So tell us uh, how you coped with that problem that Luke highlighted there. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, I have uh, Kakuma Ventures that I founded uh, now three years ago. And uh, what we do, Kakuma Ventures is a social enterprise in the camp that is owned by and managed by the refugees in the camp uh, in Kenya, uh, where thousands of refugees are stuck in protracted, protracted crisis, uh, like myself, you know, it's now for 11 years I've been in the camp. And when you look at the situation in the camp, there's not much that is happening. And now the refugees, like myself and others, we now look at how we can take things in our own hand. And that's how we started Kakuma Ventures with the aim of improving our own living conditions in the camp because we can't live on basics for 10 years, 20 years and so on. And then for that, we do provide affordable and reliable connectivity access to individuals and the businesses in Kakuma refugee camp through a collective subscription model in a, 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 through our solar powered uh, community mesh network. And that's basically what we do uh, as Kakuma Ventures. Incredible and so inspiring to hear about all you've achieved. One of the questions actually that Dawn Stevenson asked from Bayes from the UK government was sort of what can we do to really scale up some of the initiatives like UNDP in Yemen, uh, such as your own. What, what is it that would really help you to take your venture forward at a bigger scale? We have faced a lot of challenges like uh, starting and managing uh, an enterprise from the camp. First, because there's no capital flow in the camp. Uh, and as you know, humanitarian funding is allocated to basic humanitarian needs such as food, shelter and health. And also there's less promotion of refugee enterprises such as Kakuma Ventures to have access to funding or to grow or scale our businesses. And also you find like mostly a refugee camp are most likely to be located in remote area where there's no access to key infrastructure support uh, businesses such as road, uh, electrical grid and water sometimes. And all this, they make even life very difficult to live in a refugee camp or to sustain a business in a refugee camp. And for that, uh, we hope like uh, as we are putting effort by ourselves, people will come out there to support us. Now it's three years and adding to four years that they have started Kakuma Ventures and just few people have shown interest. And yet if uh, Kakuma Ventures will be in a very advanced place, then everyone will just come because people will see profit. 
and yet in the camp, you know, there's that trade off between uh, temporary and long term. Now it's proven wrong. The camp is long term. When you should live in a camp for 10 years, should I call, be called temporary? I think attention should be done uh, like on the other side, like to look at the refugees and see how they what they've been able to achieve and get support that they need for them to be sustainable with their businesses and also to be to build to be reliance. I think you've really put your finger on a key thing there, Innocent, which is actually true across energy access that most of the funding flows to one or two of the bigger organizations as opposed to getting down to the smaller initiatives like your own. Uh, I've got to at this point uh, bring in uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Rosenberg Jansen from Oxford University, a senior advisor who specialized for years now in sustainable energy for humanitarian and development context and considered one of the world's leading experts on the data that we need. So Sarah, I've got to start with that. What data do we need to really shift the situation on energy access for refugees? Yes, thank you for those kind words of uh, introduction. I feel very humbled to be here with also people who are uh, real experts and, and living that reality day to day like like innocent. Um, I quite often just say, well, I'm just the, you know, the data nerd or the grandmother who's been working on this topic for so long. But I think in terms of data, it's just such a complicated, you know, difficult question. And as Luke mentioned earlier, there really isn't a lot of, you know, data and evidence out there at the moment. I think from my perspective, there are two core areas that we really need to be paying attention to in terms of data. The first is really project specific evidence. And so things like the UNDP project and Innocence work can really contribute to that by showing us examples of what is working and how it's working and how much energy they're providing, what are the costs of energy, those types of project specific information that can come to you know people like myself and Luke and others to be able to take to donors and say, look, this is how it works. This is how much it costs. Here is how refugees are involved and how communities are involved. And the second piece is the sort of global progress data. And so there you're looking at the type of data that can be used to measure SDG 7 and say, are we really going to meet SDG 7 for displaced people by 2030? I think the answer for that is clearly no, not unless something radical changes in the next nine years. Um, I would say that without data, we are really acting in the dark as humanitarian practitioners. We're programming without baselines. Um, in theory, you know, we might guess how much access people have and that in installing renewables can reduce emissions, but we don't know the impacts of that without measuring properly on data. Um, the work I support through the GPA on, uh, on data and research there is really trying at the moment to support humanitarian agencies and their partners to reform their internal systems to start providing some of that data. Um, but there's still a sort of critical and urgent need for both this, you know, primary data collection for global processes and, you know, the real numbers coming from projects and coming from, from institutions. So, yeah, I'd say we need data quite urgently, really. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much for that extremely clear case of the data we need. And then I'd like to bring in our next panellist, uh, Auke Lutzma who is the resident representative for UNDP in Yemen. He's been there since 2019 and previously served in Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Ukraine. So I think can bring an amazing perspective of the needs facing refugees and displaced people in many countries. Um, but I have to start by asking you more about the situation in Yemen at the minute and whether you are able to get the funding that you need to tackle the energy access needs of people in Yemen, particularly given the tightening of funding. Well, thank you, Harriet, and uh, good afternoon to all here uh, on, the, on the panel and uh, online to, to listen to us to, to the discussion today. It's really an honor and a privilege to be with you today and certainly also to be a recipient of the Ashton Award. I mean, you can't imagine how proud we are of that. And also, I always uh, you know, make sure I have to thank the European Union because without their funding, this would certainly would have not been possible to to achieve. So I think uh, that's important to recognize as well. I just want to give three sets of comments, Harriet, if you don't mind, and I'll try to be brief, although I want to talk about Yemen, Yemen the whole day, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's for me a passion as well as a profession. So uh, looking, uh, but I look to be brief because I know we don't have a huge amount of time. So 
quickly on the on the humanitarian situation in Yemen. Uh, we've presented the situation to the international community not that long ago uh, uh, and saying that Yemen is still the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, certainly 24 million people are still dependent on humanitarian assistance and to our estimation going forward, we do expect that at least 16 million people will go hungry to bed every night. So it is really a very serious uh, situation at the moment that we are, we are dealing with. Now, uh, that's not enough. If, if you look at it from the development perspectives, you know, Yemen has also become the worst development crisis in the world. And I think that's also very important to underline because uh, in five years plus now of the conflict in Yemen, more than 20 years of development has been lost. Uh, it's, it's very significant. It has made Yemen the poorest nation in the world and also the nation that is furthest away from achieving the SDGs, including the SDGs relevant to access to energy as well. So it is really becoming the basket case of the world. I'm very sorry to say that, but that's the reality that we're facing at the moment uh, in Yemen. That also means, you know, service delivery and particularly also energy access has also suffered due to war damage, due to, you know, uh, uh, lack of maintenance, but also certainly because of lack of income of Yemenis. Huh? The fact that people, people are facing a famine uh, in Yemen at the moment is not because of a lack of food, but this is more to do with uh, the lack of income and also the high cost of food in Yemen. Now, coming to the point of energy accessibility for Yemenis in general, including also IDPs and refugees, is an issue of uh, a completely complex, collapsed state whereby a grid is no longer functional. And basically, people depend either on generators fueled by fossil fuels, of course, or, you know, there have to be solar solutions or off-grid uh, other energy uh, solutions for their energy uh, requirements. And I think uh, the presentation of Arvind has shown how we can deal with this problem at the moment by presenting sustainable off-grid solutions to communities who are no longer can depend on uh, any kind of grid uh, solution or you know, service delivery by, by the authorities wherever they are currently in Yemen. Having said that, you know, still more than 50% of Yemenis in the rural Yemen do not have access to electricity at all. So there is still a lot of work to be done and therefore scaling up, you know, projects like ARI is continuing to be very important for Yemenis to benefit at least the minimum access to energy uh, going forward. So I've seen some questions in the rail regarding scalability. So clearly, you know, this is one of the areas we're looking at as UNDP, uh, working with partners like the EU to scale up uh, successful projects like ARI to really provide more energy uh, to these kind of communities, communities. And hopefully we can also depend on these amazing women to take that forward in many more communities than the community in ABS, ABS alone. Now, you, let me finish. Uh, I'm just gonna ask a quick question on that. Uh, do you think this whole question about energy access for refugees, do you think it's going to make it onto the agenda of COP26 at all? Is that something that would help push this forward? Absolutely. I do not, I do not know to what extent we really have the cloud uh, in Yemen to bring that to, to the attention of the COP as, uh, as such. But hopefully by spreading the word, you know, to really... Uh, you know, continue with our robust advocacy strategy. This will help to bring that to the attention also to, uh, you know, countries outside of Yemen who, who have a similar agenda, uh, you know, going forward. So whatever we can do as, as a community here online, but also beyond, you know, to promote this, that will be, I think, a great advantage to us in Yemen as well. I just want to uh, say two more things, uh, Harry, and then I'll, 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 I'll stop there. But just uh, one is that, as UNDP, we also walk the talk. So basically we're also busy uh, bringing our dependence on fossil fuels to zero. So completely solarizing our uh, compound over this coming year. We have already achieved quite a lot, but we're hoping to complete that project, uh, you know, at home, so to speak as well. So also to kind of, you know, give the good example, right? Because I think uh, we can't just preach to others, but we also have to do it ourselves. Uh, as well. So that's something that's going forward this year, hopefully. And then finally, I wanted to say two, two, two things about, you know, scalable solutions of access to energy. And, uh, you know, 
as funny as this might seem, you know, the, the war in Yemen also kind of offers an opportunity, right? By accelerating the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And as a matter of fact, you know, Yemen has great potential. It has great potential in wind energy. It has great potential in solar energy, as we have seen, but it also has great potential in geothermal energy as well. So we're working now with partners, including the, uh, the Yemeni government, to, pro to prepare a number of big, you know, scalable proposals to the Green Climate Fund to really bring uh, a number of these big, uh, you know, uh, power generation projects uh, on grid to scale. And I'll give you one example to, to show, briefly, to show everyone then. what I'm talking about. Very briefly. Sorry? If it could be very briefly, very briefly. <laughs> to move on to some of the questions. Yeah, I'll be... Yeah. Absolutely, I'll be very brief just to say that, you know, off the coast of Mocha, we're working now on a project to uh, build up a windmill park that will hopefully produce more than 100 megawatts of power that will be feeding into the grid. So this is something that we're also looking at beyond sort of the off-grid solutions that we've been talking about just before this. I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'd actually like to pick up on that point and actually uh, one of the questions from the chat about given the... Uh, the scale of possibilities for solar. I'd like to ask Luke whether you see is one of the problems getting the investment into the private sector to take some of these initiatives forward. Is that one of the what are the biggest challenges that you see there? Yes, yeah, de definitely. There's there's a need for there's a need for funding and financing. So there's there's I think in this space there there will always be a, a role for for grant capital. Um, to to kind of to to get um, certain projects to to a certain scale to to a proof of concept um, to to test certain models for example to test the Yemen model into another country because there's no guarantee that it will just automatically be scalable in in a different context because the the whole the enabling environment the the national context really determines quite a bit. Um, so, so yes, getting capital into the private sector is is one area. You also need to have a private sector to begin with. Not every refugee hosting country has a medium mature energy access sector with private sector actors that would be able and willing to take on um, this challenge. Um, so it's it's I'd say it's it's one of the puzzle pieces, but several others need to be in place for that to actually happen and I'll, I'll just highlight one puzzle piece data you know like it's it's so so important um to for for a private sector actor to actually know how big is the gap what are the energy needs which products are in demand both on like on the on the appliance side as well as on the supply side on on the technology side because without that you can go to an investor and say, you know, like we need we need money to ref to to electrify or to provide clean cooking appliances for Kakuma Camp, and then the first question is, great, how much do you need? How big is the gap? And if you don't know the answer, I mean, that's basically where the conversation ends. So it's it, the the data part really kind of unlocks several other steps, I would say. I'd like to come to you about that, uh, Innocent, to ask whether uh, two questions actually. One is whether that's also been your experience that you've really struggled to get the data you need that would help your ventures to go forward. And secondly, I wondered if you could reflect at all on the, the, the chat that's running about the importance of initiatives to bring clean cooking for people in the camps and uh, whether in fact, indeed, your own venture also focuses on clean cooking. And then I'd like to hear from Sarah on that one as well. So Innocent, from over to you first. Yeah, thank you very much. and. Uh... Clean cooking, everything that's energy, it's really very important because uh, as it just mentioned, like it's very expensive to scale up uh, a solar system, mostly if you want to be the grid and you find like uh, places like camp, they are spread across, so it, they are spread on large area where it's really very, very hard or sometimes challenging or very costly to provide access to everyone. But if, if we have several innovative approach that can be complement the access to energy, such as clean cooking, that will save so many money, so much money, and also save some, a lot of time and even improve the living conditions of several people. Uh, for us, we provide the solar power the community uh, community mesh network, which also provide people access to learning. They can continue learning. They can be able to access connectivity and so on. And you see, like every innovative approach is welcome because there's 
technically nothing in the camp. So if you have any innovative idea that you know is supporting the in the energy sector, then you are welcome and you'll be happy to partner, to work together and to share our exper expertise in the area, in the context and so on. Thanks very much. And I'm really glad you put that focus on learning because I also, that's one of the things I also really love about the UNDP Yemen project is that focus on training and training the women. And that's so badly needed across the energy access space is to really make sure we are training people in the skills we need to provide energy access. And I don't know actually, Sarah, if that's an issue in clean cooking as well. Um, Hassan Ahmed in particular was asking about successful experiences on energy for cooking for IDPs that could then perhaps be rolled out at larger scale? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> training and capacity building, you know, it's not just for women in Yemen. I've had donors on phone calls just last week, realizing the difference between a cook stove and a fuel source, and that you probably need both if you're going to make a difference. Um, so that sort of learning, collective learning about energy access and why energy important is so important in, in all the communities, really. Um, I'd say that the cooking problem is it's you know so challenging I don't know if we've got anybody in the chat from the clean cooking alliance who wants to contribute but there are so so many many challenges and, and there are some really good examples of data and evidence especially on sort of firewood consumption and clean cooking health benefits um, that are coming out have been coming out for years from WHO and others um, but it is a, it's a very difficult um, topic. And I would say, you know, one clear message from the community is there is no one solution. So we can talk about scalability, but we also have to talk about local needs and local priorities and local uses for cooking, because it varies very, very differently within different populations and different groups of displaced people. You know, I probably don't cook the same as you do. And <laughs> what is to assume that all refugees cook the same. And so some may benefit from using LPG or technologies like that, but others may want and need different technologies and different types of solutions. And really building that bottom up and listening to people directly is a very important part of, of the sort of data and evidence story in this sector. Thanks. It's really one of the conundrums, isn't it? That we all know we need to take energy access for humanitarian settings to scale if we're going to reach everyone's needs and on the other hand it cannot be about big top down it's got to be about the bottom up grassroots and also being different in every situation which I think is something everyone's been saying. We've got loads of fantastic questions including how can we make sure we hear the voices of refugees and displaced people at COP pushing on this issue, how do we hear more about the stories of people uh, whose lives have been really changed for the better in order to help inspire more backing and support for such schemes. Uh, but I'm afraid we're not going to have time to go through all the questions. Uh, as always, some of the best questions, they all start pouring in uh, as time comes short. But I do want to go around the whole panel one more time. But to ask to hear, really hear from you, if there was sort of one ask that you could put, one policy change, one change in practice that you would like to put, what would that be? And I, I'd like to start with Alessandro, because we haven't heard from you for a while. So perhaps you could kick off with your one brief ask from everybody. So, um, I mean, our interventions um, all aim at one thing. So uh, supporting all Yemenis everywhere on, on the territory. For what concerns um, green economy and uh, and this country, we are really trying hard uh, with this uh, new Green Deal. I think it's a great opportunity to scale up uh, an activity like ERI um, to something more substantial. I have heard um, during talks with our implementing partners, um, a lot of new initiatives that could take off and we definitely support them. So for example, um, waste management, uh, we, can, we can increase that. Um, as uh, Alka mentioned, um, solar energy, fine, but also wind and water can be utilized. Um, also, uh, if we want to talk about agriculture, the dripping irrigation is already a thing in Yemen, but we can expand it. Um, our approach usually is to target selected areas and have an all-encompassing approach in that specific area. And then if it works, then expand it to other uh, areas. I hope I- That'd be fantastic. That was a great uh, summary of 
taking a pilot and expanding it. And I just want to come now to you, Alke. What would your, obviously it always needs so many different things, doesn't it? But what would your one ask or one action be? Well, exactly right. And, you know, of course, in a country like Yemen, where the needs are so overwhelming, one has to focus on certain things that may make a difference in the country. And I would really, my big ask would be to, in fact, the in, entire international community to really look at sustainable solutions to humanitarian problems in Yemen. And I think, you know, sustainable energy is certainly one of them. There is a, there is a huge need in the country, but I think we can do so much more to respond to the same problems, but in a different way and make a bigger difference to the ordinary Yemenis. And again, you know, we've seen through the ERI project how that can be done, but scalability is really the issue here. And I really, I think in that sense, we could do a lot more. And I really would like, you know, all of us to advocate for, you know, both uh, working in that direction, but also to provide more funding for these kind of solutions rather than just bringing more humanitarian assistance into the country as such. I think that again has been a real theme, hasn't it? How energy can really spark progress across livelihoods, across education, across household needs. And uh, it, we need to find the sustainable business models that enable people to earn an income so that it's not f dependent on aid. Um, Luke, what would your one, one ask be? I'll, I'll take more of a policy route here. So I, I'd say at the global level, clear, we, we would like to see global ambitions um, and, and like maybe a clear targets being set, some kind of a, a grand challenge being created around this issue with a clear target and a coalition of the willing, um, both on the financing side, so the funders, the investors, as well as on the, the humanitarian energy uh, players. That then hopefully translates into, at the national level, stronger national policies, better national planning in an inclusive way. So talking about SDG 7, not just for, for a particular set of people, but at the inclusive level. So for everyone within the borders of a particular country, including displaced people, IDPs, refugee households, etc. Um, for and, and it doesn't have to be focused on the energy side exclusively, right? Like some of these policies could simply be like, a, a, a making sure that refugees, displaced people have the opportunity to own land, to work land, to work. Um, that in and of itself could have a massive impact in how we can market uh, energy services, energy products. And then the last thing I'll say is hopefully these policies and planning um, tools actually lead to strong mandates for particular agencies to take this issue on and to lead on it because a mandate hopefully then leads to accountability and I feel that is kind of the, the main Thank big you. ask that I want to uh, end with is we, we need more accountability in this space as well so that when we set a target that we actually try to reach it collectively. That's a, a good challenge even if you definitely sneaked in more than one ask there. Sarah coming to you next. Yeah, I mean, from accountability to inclusivity, that would be my big ask, is that we start yeah. working on refugee-led approaches. All the answers I just heard, to be very honest, were top-down uh, impositions through the humanitarian system, and that really needs to change to start doing things sustainably and inclusively. If you want more data on humanitarian energy, ask displaced people, ask refugees. If you want to know what solutions are needed and wanted and useful, work with displaced people to decide them. And if you want voices at COP, uh, from refugees and displaced people, invite them. <laughs> that would be my advice. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's the first option to really ask refugees and displaced people directly, what do you already have? What do you need? And then ask, how can we support you in that? And open up a two-way conversation about solutions and not sitting there thinking, oh, I've got this really cool idea for, you know, a solar lantern or a, you know, a cook stove, but rather make this a two-way conversation and start with what people need by hearing it from themselves directly. So inclusivity is my one big ask to counter Luke's uh, wonderful ask for uh, accountability, which is so important as well. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, indeed, that is echoed in the chat, talking about the need to change from top down to co-designing with refugees. So innocent, last word from the panel, what would your number one action or ask B? Yeah, for me, I consider energy to be the backbone of a, any busting economy. And it is with proper access to energy that we will be able to build and power sustainable. Oh, we've lost you, Innocent. We've lost you. You're on mute. And we do really want to hear. Do you want to go again? We missed it. 
Yeah, sorry for that. I'm, I'm saying like, uh, for me, I consider energy to be the backbone of any bursting economy. And it is with proper access to energy that we'll be able to build and power sustainable refugee communities and also break the cycle of dependency and improve access to refugee individuals and the entrepreneurs to services and so on. And also refugees should be involved in development projects and have their say, their views considered in developing strategies that target them. Because refugees already started a lot of things, they have already a lot of initiative, and they are, there's always a room to partner and to collaborate with them and to reach out even more. Thank you so much, Innocent. That was beautifully uh, summed up. Uh, I would have one more ask. I hope from Ashton's point of view that you will continue to talk about these issues, that you will continue to put the spotlight on the extraordinary work being done by people like Essie for All, like Sarah, like UNDP Yemen, and indeed by Innocent and Kakuma Ventures, that I hope you will, if you can, continue supporting financially and in other ways these amazing initiatives that you will uh, talk about this on Twitter and on social media, and that you would also continue consider supporting Ashton and our 2021 award on energy access for humanitarian settings, because we're looking for the last bit of funding now for that to be uh, a flying success this year too. And I'd actually like to bring in here Sarah butler loss who's the founder and former CEO of Ashton and now our chair. Um, and Sarah, I know you've backed this award personally. Um, when you've, there are so many demands on you, what, what you would support, why did you choose this award? Well, thank you. Thank you, Harriet, for that question. But also thank you so much to all the um, speakers and panelists. It's been unbelievably moving and impressive to hear all you've done. And it is so moving to see what's been achieved at Yemen. So my hat's off to you all. But just as to why um, I want to, why I personally support this award. I mean, from the very beginning, from when I started up Ashton and before, one of the key reasons I set it up was really to help find the champions that were bringing clean energy um, to people that had no electricity or no clean cooking. And I wanted you know, them to be celebrated and rewarded. I wanted to support them to, ex we wanted to support them to expand and we wanted to prom promote their solutions to, to uh, so that others could follow. Um, and why was I interested in that? It was largely because seeing the huge benefits that energy brings when you're on the ground and you see it on the ground, it's phenomenal. It brings benefits to people in their homes, in their schools, in their hospitals, in their shops. Um, and on their small holdings. Clean electricity and clean cooking improves health and well-being. It enables better education, improves food security, increases livelihoods, as we've heard today and as beautifully described by Innocent just now. It also, we've seen with Yemen and always does, it can break social and gender barriers. Um, so it's incredibly important. Now, although We've made huge progress, as, as um, Harriet said at the beginning, there's been huge progress at bringing energy access to many more people than uh, was back in 2001 when I founded Ashton. There's still so many people that are left behind. And one huge sector of that is refugees and displaced people. Um, it's shocking and chilling to understand that 18 million, there are 18 million displaced vulnerable people in the world and 80% of those that are in refugee camps or, or camps have no access to clean cooking and 90% have no access to electricity. All of those people are denied all of those benefits that energy can bring from such as um, light in times of darkness and enabling dignified work better health and good education. It's so important. So that is why I support this award full, full heartedly as it were. Um, and the support that this award brings to many more refugees and displaced peoples. It is also why I encourage all of you that are listening to please think about supporting this award and the work that goes behind it and the work that supports refugees and displaced people. 
Your support would support our winners to expand their work and reach many more refugees, as well as showcase their innovations to funders and to governments. And for every pound you give, it is matched by a generous donor so that your support can be doubled. So please consider it. And thank you. Thank you everyone again. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you thank so you. much, Sarah. And you can all see uh, in the chat, the link to our appeal for the Humanitarian Energy Award. Uh, and it is now time for us to go back to our daily lives. I would like to really thank so much uh, all of you, uh, Arvind uh, and the UNDP team for joining us along with the fantastic panel. It really was an absolute pleasure and very inspiring. And it was a nightmare as the chair to try to, uh, I wanted so much to ask so many questions of all of you and I could see them in the two different chats that were running and we just didn't have enough time, but I hope we will have other opportunities and I hope one day we'll be able to meet in person. And I would once again like to particularly thank Innocent for coming at such short notice and sharing so powerfully all that you're doing uh, with your venture and we wish you all the best. So thank you very much everybody and we look forward to being in touch with you again in the future. Bye-bye.